Hi, um, over the last few years I've done quite a lot of work with various uh, lead matrix displays, um, various shapes and sizes, mostly monochrome. Um, these are generally tend to be fairly large, you know, large scale and um, fairly high power, wanting to run the LED sort of quite close to their ratings to get a decent amount of light output. Um, I've generally used a fairly conventional drive approach using um, standard PWM drivers. But I wanted to um, take a look at approaches for much smaller scale things, uh, in particular how practical it would be to use an FPGA with sort of very little else to drive a, a fairly high density but fairly small low power LED matrix. And here's a small example I did a while ago. This is a 16x16 matrix. Um, it's actually wired as a 8x32 um, because um, as you go up to, six, to um, 16 rows the lead peak currents get a bit high so in terms of maximising the brightness um, 8 to 1 multiplex is about the highest you want to go and if you want to really um, hammer it then um, 4 to 1 is, is about the optimum in terms of not overloading the leads um, in terms of peak current and this is just uh, there's an AVR driving two of these macro block drivers. These are 16 channel constant current drivers with built in PWM. Um, the function is fairly similar to the Texas 5941 or the um, NXP's 9685. I, uh, I prefer the macro block uh, devices, these are MBI 5031s. Um, there's a number of reasons. One is they're nice and cheap. Um, they're available in quite a wide range of packages, but also they, um, the drive system is quite clever on them. When you're sending data, data to them, you've got this uh, latch signal and depending on the length of that latch pulse it does different functions so as well as latching the data in. You can do things like setting the um, drive current and a few other odds and ends, set, the, um, set a few different types of uh, PWM mode. And the nice thing is, when you're, although these are designed to be driven in large scale sort of video screens from FPGAs, um, what you can actually do is you can actually generate these pulse widths if you um, use a PWM peripheral and feed the serial clock into the clock of your PWM, you can actually generate all these different pulse widths really easily, so it's quite easy to stream data out of a microcontroller into these chips, certainly at the small scale, as you start to go up in scale the speeds start getting a bit uh, tricky because if you're using a multiplex display you have to load each row's worth of data, then display that row, then load the next row and display that, There's not, you know, they don't have um, multi-bank memory or anything, so you end up with quite a high data rate going into them if you've got uh, more than a sort of fairly small number of them. Uh, the other thing I like about these chips is that they've got a few different PWM modes. I mean, you've got the conventional PWM mode, mode where you've got, just got a single on-off cycle, but they've also got what they call a scrambled uh, mode, where what they do is they split the PWM, and these do normally 12 bits, and they split it in that you, over the whole cycle, you get 64 short pulses, and then the other six bits it actually distributes around them. So, for example, if you're at 50%, you'd get sort of you get 64 pulses with a 50% duty cycle. As you go to 50% plus one bit, one of these pulses will get longer, then, then sort of the, ne the next up you'd get two pulses longer. So it basically distributes the fine PWM among, across all the pulses, which means that your actual frequency is quite a few kilohertz, which is really good if you've got displays that mustn't produce any flicker on video. Obviously that doesn't apply when you're doing a matrix, but if you're driving them um, just single LEDs with these, um, that's a really big advantage over more conventional um, LED drivers. Um, the the macro block chips are a little bit harder to get hold of, um, but I use so many of these I just tend to buy these in a, a reel of 2000 at a time. I think I'm on about my third or fourth reel at the moment. The reason for starting to look into this is I was, I was looking at driving some quite small displays. Um, actually, I'd, I'd, I'd actually just ordered some PCBs for, to use some uh, really tiny LEDs to make a 32x32 about this size, which should be uh, quite interesting. But I was just using, I got these a while ago, These I was using these for testing. They're not particularly great brightness wise, but um, they do the job for testing. But the other thing I was very interested in was driving these um, Chinese RGB video wall tiles. Um, this is actually a 3mm pitch one, but these are available in quite a lot of different shapes and sizes, up to like sort of 16mm pitch. Um, they're used for sort of all the big video screens, but the, these are just insanely cheap. This this is a uh, 64 by 32 and uh, you can get these for about $60 or so from China which I mean you can't buy the lead for anything like that so um, they're quite a nice cheap off-the-shelf solution and they've got a fairly standardized interface as well um, so I really wanted to get some get something going to drive these for a, a few uh, upcoming potential projects let's take a look at the basic structure um, of these, these uh, panels 
Um, my sort of direct drive thing is basically works in exactly the same way. Um, it's just that some of the logic that's on here is actually done in the FPGA. So we've got our matrix of LEDs arranged as um, these are always arranged so that the rows are anode and the columns are cathode. For each row you've got a MOSFET driving it and this is driven by a, um, a demultiplexer, typically almost always a 748C138. So depending on the binary value input here it will, it will basically take one of these outputs low to enable one row at a time. Now in terms of the old matrixing thing um, and how we drive it we can actually ignore all this row stuff because it's just you know, whatever we do to light up a column we just repeat that for each row so um, that complication actually disappears fairly readily. And the bottom edge uh, across the column we've got uh, column drivers. Now these are generally something like this. Um, there's quite a few different manufacturers, Macrobrock do them as well as several others, but they're they're very similar to the uh, 74HC595, the only difference being they've got constant current output drivers and there's almost always a, an external resistor that sets the um, the global current through the LED so you can actually, if you want to twit hack these panels, you'll almost always find, for example on this panel, here are the drivers, there's always these resistors so if you want to mess about with driving LEDs at different currents then you can mess around with those resistor values. So we've got a 16-bit shift register, data in, data out, a clock signal for that. We've got a uh, an output latch, so we clock the data through, we then hit the latch to update all the outputs simultaneously, and then the um, constant current drivers. Um, the other thing you have on here is an output enable, and that, that's, that's very important, which I'll uh, explain in a minute why that's important. So they're, they're, these are very simple devices and they're really, really cheap. Um, I've not looked recently, but when I looked a couple of years ago, these were like 20p or something for a 16-bit driver in 1,000 uh, of quantities. They're probably even cheaper nowadays because they're used in such vast quantities. Um, so this is the, the basic structure of a monochrome panel. You don't often see that. You sometimes see signage type panels uh, structured like this. And for RGB panels, Basically you just have three sets of column drivers, one driving each colour. Um, the reason that they do that instead of, for example, going RGB, RGB on a single driver is you quite often want to have different currents going through different colours because of the different LED characteristics to get, to get a balance of the different colours. So your inputs to the panel are, you've got clock, um, enable, latch, and then you've got a data in for each colour. And for a 32 high panel, you generally have, they tend to be arranged as two blocks. So you'll actually have another set of drivers for you have a separate set of drivers for the top and the bottom half of the panel. So, for example, on a panel like this, you've got RGB inputs for the top half, RGB inputs for the bottom half, and a common um, row. So that yeah, that row that row and that row enable at the same time. But you have to simultaneously feed it data for these two blocks as you uh, move across the panel. The difference between these drivers and the ones I, I, I've sort of tend to use in the past is there, there's no, no built-in modulation. So how do you do the grayscaling? Now obviously the conventional way of modulating a LED is you give it a variable, variable length pulse. The longer the pulse, the brighter the LED goes. Now this, yeah, this is fine if you're driving small numbers of LEDs, but it doesn't really scale very well to um, larger arrays for a number of reasons because effectively in each column you actually have to have your you know separate PWM register and um, a counter which ends up using quite a lot of logic. So there's actually a, a better way of doing it which is what, what these panels do. Right just to simplify this I'll pretend that we're only going to do um, 16 levels which is four bits of grayscaling. What we do is we instead of doing that single pulse we actually do we create four time periods, each one double the next. So our length is one, two, four, eight within a, a regular cycle. So within each row we'll do, we'll do this. So basically what we do is depending on how bright we want the LED to go, we decide whether or not to turn the LED on during each of these periods. So for example if we wanted the LED on for 50% we'd only turn it on during the 8 period and if we wanted it, let's say 75%, we turn it on during the 8 period and the 4 period. So this is where these um, output enables come in. This is, this is the signal that goes into our output enables. So what we do is we shift all the... So this will be correspond to bit 3, 2, 1, 0 of our grayscale input data. So what we do is the first thing we do is we shift all the bit threes for an, for an entire row into our shift registers, latch those and then turn this enable on for this amount of time. 
we then, after that display period, we then shift all the all the bit twos into the column, turn it on for this amount of time, then all the bit ones, etc. The simplest way is that we'd be shifting our data here, shifting our data here, and then latching it there, shift it, latch it there, and so on. Um, one issue that does come up is obviously the amount of time taken to shift this data can, can be quite significant, especially if you've got a really large panel or you're going, going over long cables. So what can happen there is if these gaps start getting bigger, that reduces your maximum possible brightness um, because you've got these gaps. Now there is scope for, because we've got that output latch, we can actually be clever. So as, for example, as soon as we turn on, we've shifted our data, for, let's say for this period, as soon as we've latched that we can actually now be shifting the data for the next period so we can actually overlap these um, it may all be for the really short periods we have to add a bit of padding but generally a lot of that shift time can be hidden within this amount of time so we get quite a yeah, our highest brightness is quite you know works out as quite a high proportion of on time um, there's a few other things that we can do for example if we want a global intensity control without losing the amount of color depth we can just pad this time out to make the so that this is a smaller proportion of the overall time. The other thing we can do if we want to get start getting really clever is just add, add some global scaling onto the length of these pulses as well. But it means that the, um, the basic method of doing the intensity modulation it, um, is the same and we still get, even if we say we scale these pulses and we do that, we've still got our full 16 levels of brightness. Um, in practice for colour you generally use um, 250 levels, so you'd have 8 periods from 1 to 8 down to 1 cycle time. If you're doing monochrome you generally want a bit more than that to get a good um, a good grayscale. But um, so that's the big basic principle. It doesn't really matter whether you do it, yeah, which order you do these in. Th this amount of time is going to be one row which is going to be of the order of um, no more than a few milliseconds because if you're doing 16 rows you need to do this 16 times and obviously only one row is physically illuminated at a time so you need to do that fast enough that you don't get any visible rippling. So in practice, you might let, yeah, let's say for example you're aiming at say um, 50, 50 frames a second update, your row time would be 1 16th of that, which would be uh, just over a millisecond or so, which is your um, row time to give a 16 millisecond um, frame time. Um, there's a few other tricks you could do, for example if you're struggling to get, get a fast enough refresh you could do these, in, you don't have to do these in a sequential order, you could interleave them, so you do uh, all the odd rows first, then all the even rows give you a little bit more um, higher effective frame rate, the same trick they used to do on, uh, on TV signals. So basically, yeah, th th this is the principle. So using simple on-off control, we just effectively generate a bit's worth of intensity data. Now, obviously, you could use this same principle with microcontrollers. Um, the problem is that because you're sort of shuffling these data bits around, it, it gets quite inefficient in terms of the sort of things, you know, you're, you're, you, you've got this block of, if we look at, let's say this is our block of column data with sort of bit zero there, bit seven here. So th these are the bytes of column data um, because we actually have to, yeah, effectively have to extract each of these bits. So we have to send all the bit zeros, then we have to send out all the bits, uh, ones, etc. Yeah, you could do it, for example, with an SPI peripheral to actually get the serial data out. The problem is that you know, it's quite memory intensive in that for each of these rows you've got to access this data eight times, one bit at a time, which microcontrollers in general aren't particularly efficient at doing. You know, yes you can do it, but it's it's the sort of thing that FPGAs are a lot more suited to because you can just structure the data um, and route the data however it however you like you can for example if you wanted nine bit intensity data you could have nine bit memory to do that whereas that starts getting really messy when you're doing it on a microcontrol that has a very far, yeah, fixed fixed data widths now I mentioned that when you're doing monochrome you quite often want more than eight bits per pixel um, the reason for that is that the eye's response to brightness is non-linear so if you just have a, a linear eight bit display um, that's basically all your um, grayscale is going to end up bunched up at the high end uh, which means that if you want to do sort of nice smooth fade sort of right down to black it can quite easily get quite steppy at the bottom end. So what you generally want to do is actually take, you, you can actually work from 8-bit data but you then add a gamma correction function which quite often can be as simple as just squaring the data and then ideally when you take that squash if you take 8-bit data you end up with a 16-bit result. And to get a really nice smooth grayscale, you generally need somewhere, certainly an absolute minimum of 10 bits, ideally 12 bits, to represent that, to avoid getting any sort of banding or steppiness during um, particularly gentle gradients and slow fades. It becomes really noticeable. 
Um, it's obviously it's notable also with RGB. RGB you've generally got 24 bits because of the colour, but of course if you're doing, for example, a very slow fade on a single colour, like say from pure green down to black, you can see this effect. Um, gamma correction doesn't work quite so well on colour because you get colour your distortions in the actual um, uh, the colours between because you know, of the way that all the three colours mix is slightly different. And you can use it if you're doing sort of subtle fades and so on, and you don't too care too much about the absolute colour. It can work quite well, um, but it's particularly important on a monochrome display um, where pure 8-bit linear just doesn't really work very well for a lot of content types. Quick illustration of why you need some sort of uh, gamma correction on monochrome displays. Um, this may not come out very well because of the camera and the encoding and the other stuff, but um, in terms of viewing by eye it makes a big difference. So this top half is non-gamma corrected, so this is a linear progression from full white to black. Uh, to sort of rather, and you can see it sort of as you go across it's white, 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 and then the, the actual grey scale down sort of is really sort of concentrated at this low end. So if you're trying to do very smooth fades up here you end up with very low, low resolution. Whereas this bottom half, this is gamma corrected using a very simple square, i.e. You know, it's just taking the value, squaring it, and then displaying the upper bits of that. And you can see you get a much more progressive fade. The mid-grey is sort of more towards the middle. The, uh, yeah, the granularity between one grey and the next is much more evenly distributed. So if you're doing a very slow, smooth up and down fade, it means you don't get any step, um, so much steppiness towards the bottom end. Right, now the, the first really sort of super simplistic FPGA approach I was looking at for driving a, a standalone display, not one of these um, panels, was to basically literally just connect the matrix straight up to the FPGA pins, rely on the internal current limiting. Uh, most FPGA pins you can actually select an output current. It's not yeah, not really designed for um, controlling lead current, but I'll just, yeah, just this is a sort of let's, let's see how, how much we can abuse this thing and see if it works. Obviously a limiting factor here is that you're trying to drive quite a number of LEDs on each row simultaneously. Um, I think the column drives we can probably get away with because the, the sort of scale I'm looking at driving at sort of in the sort of 5 to 20 milliamp sort of range on the columns, but because obviously potentially you could have quite a lot of columns on at once, you're up into the 100 milliamps um, on the roads. But say attempt one, let's just sit, sit, see how well it works. Right, so this is now hooked up to a um Lattice X02 FPGA and it actually works surprisingly well. Um, th these displays aren't particularly efficient. Um, these actually use, uh, these are actually an array of blue LEDs and there's like a white phosphor on the top. And um, I, I thought when I, I did a fairly high power array of these a while ago and they're just, you have to pump a ridiculous amount of power into them to uh, get them to go brightly. But at low lighting levels it actually works uh, quite nicely. I mentioned these before um, just in case you didn't see uh, the video on that. Um, the, although sort of Altair and Xilinx are the big FPGA manufacturers, um, I actually really like these XO2s from Lattice. Um, there's a number of reasons. They've got you know, a lot of the um, uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff is built in. You've got a built-in core voltage regulator, onboard flash for the configuration, and there's also an onboard oscillator. So literally, you can set these up so all you need is a 3.3 volt power supply, and they'll do something, um, which is really nice. But I also really like that every FPGA manufacturer should make boards like this. This is just a really cheap. They're like 20 quid or so. It's just got the basics on it. It's got the FPGA, it's got a USB interface for configuring it, it breaks all the pins out on, onto headers, it's got the voltage regulators, there's a footprint for a, for a crystal, although they don't even fit that, and that's it. There's actually there's a bunch of eight LEDs as well, which is quite handy. And you know, for just really basic FPGA stuff, you know, it's cheap enough to be used as expendable, and this is a previous one that I just hacked, hacked all sorts of stuff on onto it. But um, for example, the uh, like the IO bank voltages, you can just take a link off of here and then feed a different IO bank voltage onto the header. So, yeah, this is really it's the absolute bare minimum you need to do FPGA stuff, but it's cheap enough to just use as a uh, a component. So, um, you know, big thumbs up to Lattice uh, for for doing this sort of stuff, and it's not the sort of thing you see very often, certainly from the manufacturers. Um, you know, low end FPGAs with just haven't got tons of other stuff on the board because a lot of it you're not going to use, but it just means they're nice and cheap, they're nice and simple, and you can just sort of plug and go. So, literally, all I've done is yeah, this display is literally wired straight to the pins. Um, the data is just coming from a little board, this is just a little PIC24 SD card player. Um, for something that does like a standalone playback, the way to go would be to use SPI flash because it's just so cheap these days. One reason is that these serial flashes tend to be used for PC motherboard BIOSes. I mean, Span can do a 4 megabit flash that's about 12p. 
and you can get 32 megabytes for a couple of quid, which something like this would, would hold sort of 32,000 frames. Um, this is actually running at 32 by 32, although it's only displaying 16 by 16. So for like a little standalone animation player, that's really what I'm looking at doing. Right, I've just set, set this up um, with a progressively increasing brightness on all pixels, eight bits of intensity resolution. If you take a look at the, um, the waveforms, this top one, this is the row enabled, so we've got one, um, 16 rows, so this this is enabling one row every 16. And if you actually look, now look at the, um, the detail of what's happening on each row, this is the, um, these are all the pulse lengths for each bit, so we've got, expand it here, we've got sort of one, two, four, 16, 32, 64128 so these are our potential um, on times and this is the actual that this is the column drive for one column now this is active low so a low means means it, it's on and we're just counting up a binary pattern so you can see here that as it gets brighter we get more and more of these low so for although yeah we're looking at one specific column but because we're showing yeah we, we've got the same pattern over the, all, all columns they're, they're all actually the same but obviously this will change for each individual column so you can see we've got this binary counting pattern as the brightness is increasing um, just enabling it within each of these um, these bit times to produce the uh, required brightness let's just take a look at how those FPGA pins are actually uh, doing with that load um, this is basically a single um, single frame period so we, this is our row drive and this is our column drive here so if I just uh, superimpose these so we've only got our supplier off top and bottom you can see that the um, the columns are actually getting pretty close to close to zero but when we've got quite a few columns on we can see that the row voltage is actually dipping down quite significantly depending on the content so we will get a certain amount of sort of ghosting in terms of if there's a lot of columns on that's going to reduce our sorry if there's a lot of columns on then the row voltage is dropping and that's going to dim down that that thing so it's, it's not yeah it works but it's not ideal um so i think adding some row drivers is probably going to make uh, quite a big difference to the uh what brightness we can get out and i've set the uh, FPGA output pins to their maximum drive, so it probably is abusing the chip to some extent, but it does seem to work. There is obviously scope also, although this is normally 3.3 volts, we can sort of crank the voltage up a little bit and uh, get a bit more drive out of it. And again, I can't remember off the top of my head what the absolute max on this FPGA is, but I did accidentally run it at 4.2 volts and it still worked. At some point, maybe if I hooked it up to a cheaper FPGA, I might actually just turn this up and see what happens, see how far it will go. And as you'd expect, as we light more columns, the overall brightness falls off. It's a little bit hard to see on the video, um, but there is quite a, a very noticeable reduction in brightness with more columns. And as you can see here, the, uh, the road drive voltage is progressively dropping as we light more columns up. So we're sort of losing almost sort of half, over half a volt there. Right, I've just bodged in some MOSFETs to um, drive the top eight rows, see how much difference that makes. So the top half is the top half is with the MOSFETs, the bottom half is straight from the FPGA. And again now you can see as you increase the loading the tops stop top stays a lot more uh, solid. Although I mean the difference isn't huge. One issue is that um, perceived brightness is a sort of square function, so if you um, you know, to get double the perceived brightness you basically have to put four times as much power in there so um, you know, the drop from just the raw FPGA version isn't as big as you might think so um, the, this, the efficiency of these LEDs isn't particularly great I think with uh, lower LEDs that give better brightness at lower current they might be a lot more viable to drive without even the row drivers but um, for the sake of some uh, sort of little uh, dual boss effects I think it makes uh, quite a big difference and obviously puts quite a bit less stress on the FPGA Obviously this also gives you more scope for cranking the voltage up because you can increase the voltage just on the MOSFETs. Um, you can't go too far because you'd end up with level shifting issues between the 3.3 volts from the FPGA and the, um, uh, the, your supply. But you can sort of add sort of maybe half a volt or so and um, say increasing the voltage that's going up to about 4 volts does make a, a bit of a difference if you want to really uh, crank brightness up. But um, certainly adding those MOSFETs does... Uh, help quite significantly although on um, sort of more more random content it actually makes less of a difference yes yeah, so on normal content it makes less of a difference it's only just about noticeable that top half is brighter 
so obviously it depends a lot on what sort of content you're intending to uh, display. Right, so seeing as this uh, protocol is pretty much the same for driving a matrix directly um, and a panel, I thought I'd hook this panel up, so I just literally um, brought all the signals out and connected it up, and away it goes. Obviously I'm only using one colour channel, and also I'm only sending 32 pixels, so it's just showing garbage on the other side of the panel, but um, that works quite nicely. Right, now I had um, got that working, I thought, well, it's not, not, not that big a step to go to full colour. All it needs is the extra six channels generating and the extra columns, so... Uh, Let's go for it. This might look a little bit flickery because it's not very, this probably isn't synced to the uh, camera particularly well. These panels do look quite dotty close up, but you, you can get a quite nice effect if you just put a diffuser over them just to diffuse the dottiness. It works quite nicely. Um, one other thing to note with these, uh, although they're nominally rated at 5 volts, um, obviously when they're running quite heavily they can draw a fair amount of power. Um, but the you can actually reduce the voltage slightly. Um, basically, if you give it some static content and then reduce the voltage just to the point where the current starts going down, because they've got current, constant current drivers, above a certain voltage the current won't increase very much. Um, so if you actually turn the voltage down to somewhere around 4 volts, it won't look any less bright, but you'll, you'll be saving power, but also you'll be saving heat generation within the panel. So if you want to run a panel, particularly if you want to run a panel really hard, then it's it's worth actually optimising the supply voltage, obviously making sure you don't have any you know voltage drops down, down the long cable. But basically all the voltage you need is obviously the forward voltage of the LEDs, which for the green and blues will be around 4 volts, uh, sorry, um, around 3 volts, plus whatever the dropout voltage is of the constant current driver, which is typically of the order of about a volt. Um, so you can actually save quite a lot of power and heat just by optimising the um, voltage for each panel. So let's just do a little extreme test and just blast this panel close to full power. It's not quite full power because of the gaps between our, um, our pulses, but it's probably within sort of 5% full power. At full white it's pulling about 3.1 amps, but you'll see as we increase the voltage there's very little difference until we hit just below 4, that, that's now starting to decrease and that's the point where you start seeing um, a reduction in brightness but also a shift towards red because red LEDs have a lower voltage so as you go, go further into the dropout the voltage dips down you'll see the panel go to red because the blue and the green LEDs will stop, stop, stop. So it's out to about, just about 4 volts, so from 4 volts to 5 volts there's almost no difference but it means we're saving 20% of the power and 20% um, of the heat just by reducing that voltage which is uh, worth doing, certainly on, if you're doing something on a sort of fairly large scale. So this little lattice board actually makes quite a nice little setup for driving these. It's literally just ribbon cable straight into the, um, the panel, obviously with some pin-out juggling. And I'm just feeding this with serial data from the PC, and literally all that sending is literally that uh, 8 zero byte plus um, the block of, data, block of RGB data formatted as per an, um, an uncompressed AVI file. Um, any flicker you can see on this, this is just the, the interaction between the camera's frame rate and the panel frame rate. I haven't really pa paid any attention to getting, the, getting this to be a sensible frame rate. It's probably actually running quite fast. Um, if you slow it down a little bit, then you'll probably it'll, it'll occupy multiple frames of the uh, camera. But um, it's looking a bit flicker in the viewfinder. I'm not sure if it's as flickery in the uh, main playback or not. One of the things I like about the um, Mac X02 is that it's got an internal oscillator. Unfortunately, it's only um, guaranteed to be about 5% accurate, which isn't really enough for doing uh, UART comms. And obviously, um, getting data into this thing, UART's going to be by far the easiest thing. But of course, one nice thing about being an FPGA is you can roll your own custom UART to work around problems like this. So basically what I've done is I've set it up so that the idea of the protocol is really simple. You send it a packet of data, it stuffs it in the display RAM and it displays it. So basically what you do is you send the first byte of 8 zero. This, um, this asserts the line for 8 bit times. And what it does is when it sees that first start bit, it starts, it starts a timer and basically measures the length of that initial 8 zero byte. It then uses that as the board rate for the subsequent bytes. And then there's a timeout. So this line here, this shows when, when this is low, it's waiting for this start bit for the auto board. When it's high, it means it's got the auto board. And then there's a time period after which it will then drop back to looking, uh, looking for data. So as long as it's seeing data, it will just hold in that mode. So if I um, extend that packet with another byte, 
you see it's carrying on waiting so it waits until there's no transitions for quite a while then it drops back so um, this is working at one megabit this is the actual bit sample you know, where it's actually sampling the data bits that is the I've got a byte ready indicator and this is the um, basically the board rate generator so what we'll see is if I now send it send um, a byte at two two megabits we'll see once it's received the um, that first eight zero at two megabits, we'll see the speed of this change, and then the, the sample points change. So now we see the board, our board time has sped up, and also our sample time has sped up. But we can see it's still sampling nicely in the middle of each bit. And yeah, because this functionality is fairly simple, it's actually um, only a few lines of VHL, VHDL to um, implement both the UART and the auto board. Right, let's take a very quick look at the VHDL code behind this. So this isn't meant to be a tutorial or anything, it's just really to give you a, a very a rough flavour of what's involved and just get a feel for those people who aren't that familiar with uh, FPGAs. These first two lines, these are basically doing the functions that would be, if you're using one of the, uh, like the RGB matrix panels, these are actually functions that are done in the hardware on those panels. So for example, this is a, um, a, a 5 to 32 line demultiplexer to generate the row signal. Um, so basically that's just simply saying output a 1 on that row bit when the address matches. So um, it's like a you know, 474HC138 effectively. Um, this next line, this is just uh, the output latch to um, set the column value. So this is the, your 32 column uh, values to be equal to, to your column shift register, or sorry, the latch on your um, shift register when the enable is high. Otherwise, um, set it to one, which because it's an active low drive it is. Uh, is off so um, basically that that is the output state if you're using say something like an HC595 or similar that is effectively the output latch of the HC595 and because we're driving the LEDs directly from the FPGA we just think you know these are included here whereas if you're driving an external panel the this function would actually be done by those external registers so here we're generating the um, read address for our display memory. So for example, if we had a 32 by 32 um, pixel display, we'd have 1K pixels of RAM. So our read address is the common incentive. This um, ampersand, this is the way VHDLs operate for um, merging bit fields. So we've got a 5-bit row, row address, a 5-bit column address. So we're merging those to produce a 10-bit display address for our 1K pixel memory. This is just mapping the row address to our the actual process, yeah, our count for, for the rows. The reason uh, this is separated out is that you might want to do some interleaving. So if you're getting quite tight on update rate, instead of displaying all the rows from top to bottom, you may want to perhaps do an interleave. So you display rows sort of zero to you know, all the odd rows first, then all the even rows, just to reduce the um, the flick across the panel. So if we check, replace this with something which remap the bits. That would allow us to do that really easily. The row number and the RAM address are still tied together so the only thing that's display change would actually be the, the order in which it's displayed and not, not any of the actual mapping. This is generating basically it's extracting the bit that we want for each of the um, time periods we want to extract one bit so for example we've got 8 bit depth we've got 8 bits in our display memory so all this is doing is taking our mask this is a, this mask value represents which of the eight bits we're um, displaying so that's just a single rotating bit in an eight bit field this word this is the output from our display ram so for eight bit bit depth this will be an eight bit field we're masking that we're anding that with our single little bit that's moving across and if that's zero we're creating a one the reason we're doing it this way around is because our columns are active low one means basically um, off and zero means on so that's just literally taking generating a single bit from the and of our display data and our mask so that just tells us whether um, that particular column needs to be on or off at uh, any given time the reason it's done here rather than later is just to, to make it, the code a bit more readable so this is our main state machine which has only got three states um, we've got an initial startup state. We've got an initial startup state that basically makes sure everything is in the right, yeah, starts off in the right place. So um, 
frame count. This is simply I'm doing using to generate test patterns. This isn't part of the display thing. It's just something that I want to do once per frame. So anything you want to do once per frame, for example, if you're doing some double buffering, you might want to do this is where you do your page swap. Basically, this occurs at startup and then once per frame. So we're just resetting our column count to zero, resetting our row count. This is a VHDL fiddle that basically says that however wide this bit field is, set them all to zero. If you use a simple constant, the constant has to be exactly the right width. So if you're parameterizing things to make stuff different bit, different widths, then this is just a uh, just a VHDL quirk that means just however many bits this thing has, just set it to zero. And we're setting up our mask. Again, this is another VHDL fiddle um, because our mask might be different widths depending on how wide we want our display. It's basically saying set the bottom bit and set all the other bits to zero. So this is our walking one one bit that rotates through as we um, do each bit time. And this is now setting the next state of our state machine is the shift phase. So that this next phase, what we're doing is we're um, shifting, we're generating a, a register which has got all the bits for each pixel. So for example, in the first period, we're generating bit zero of each of the 32 columns. Then the next one will be bit one. Again, this is a function which would happen if you're using external latches. This is actually a function that the external latches would do. Um, this is simply a shift register. We're saying this is a 32-bit shift register. So we're saying set the 32 bits to the lower 31 bits and then merge in this bit, which is the on-off state for the column in that particular um, bit time. Uh, we're incrementing the column count. And when we've done all the columns, we then globally enable, so this is the start of our time period for displaying that column of data. We're setting the next state will be our display phase where we actually time that, the length of that. And this is basically telling us how long to display that pulse for. What we're doing is we're taking the mask, because this is a walking one, combining that function to do two things. One is it's selecting which bit we want, but secondly it's selecting how long we want to display. So that's the weight of each bit represented as the time it displays. So we're taking that. The other thing we're doing is we're actually adding some padding so that generally what you want to be doing is clocking the data out fairly quickly and then displaying it for an amount of time. Um, so all we're doing is we're adding some additional padding at the bottom end of this, this timer so that, for example, if that padding was, say, 4 bits, then our first display period will be 16 cycles, the next one will be 32, the next one will be 64, and so on. Um, it just makes, makes the timing a bit nicer. So this is now the state for our display cycle. All we're doing is we're decrementing our timer if the timer is hit one, one just happens to be because of the way the, um, the state machine works. That's the one. That's the value that gives us our right, our correct answer. We're disabling the column drive, so whatever was on is now being turned off. We're rotating our mask. All this is. It looks a bit fiddly, but it's only fiddly because it's been parameterized to allow the width to be changed. But all we're saying is, take that one bit and just rotate it through. So it's a simple rotate operation. So we're now telling it the uh, the next state should be a shift, unless, basically, again, if, if we've done all our bits for that column, we then finish and go on to the next row. And if we've done the last row, then we go back to our frame start and we're, we're all done. So, yeah, basically that's it. One thing, um, it can be a bit hard to get your head around in VHDL. The, yeah, this looks a lot like code, because it looks like it's doing stuff in sequence, but it's not. A process in VHDL uh, basically is a priority encoder. So if we look at this example down here, where we're saying the display state should be shift, but on this on this condition here, then it should be frame start. Now, the, you know, the natural way to think about it is, oh, that's doing a sequence, a bit like when you assign variables in a programming language. You're saying, oh, we set it to that value, but under this condition, we set it to a different value before you then use it again. That's not what's happening. What's happening within a process is it, it basically is generating logic to prioritize these things. So what it's actually doing is it, it's generating logic that says, if this condition is true, that basically overrides this statement. It's almost like, you know, if you just think of like a tree of logic gates, as you go sort of left to right through the progression of those gates, you're moving sort of top to bottom here in terms of priority. So the last thing you do, the latest thing in a process, has the highest priority, and that will override anything that happens 
previously, but say this is not happening as a sequence in time. It's all happening effectively in parallel, but just arranged so that certain um, the things which are written down later happen at a higher priority. And because because this uh, everything in here is actually within this rising edge. Thing. That, that's the standard way of creating a clock system. So what this is effectively generating is a great big latch with all these various um, values latched on each clock. And the input to that latch is, these, is this priority logic. So for example, what it's generating here is that will actually be generating an adder. So it's taking the output of the, the latch, the five latch bits corresponding to this, and feeding them into an adder the other input of which is one, and yeah, because we're, we're we're inside this again, the, 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 this case acts almost like a basically a multiplexer. So when our the, the, this is just two bit value, uh, and these are just simply constants. So when our multiplexer select is equal to this value, then the input to this latch, for example, is zero. The input to this latch is an adder taking the previous value and one. The input again, this is a constant, and the latch bits corresponding to our state are again this, this constant value. In this state, again, we, yeah, we can consider this is, this is just another input to our, our big multiplexer. Output bits corresponding to this value are basically yeah, yeah, the shifted version of, of the output with this new bit in it. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to do a VHDL tutorial here, it's uh, and just sort of, yeah, just trying to give a sort of flavour of what's actually going on, and um, yeah, how how simply say yeah, the, most of the, the yeah this display process is really all expressed in about sort of twenty five lines of code. So the whole UART is just a couple of uh, fairly simple state machines. It could probably be merged into one, but I thought I'd keep it simple. Um, so we've got our two input signals. We've got our clock, which is running at, so in this case, 88 megahertz. Um, and that, that's the other thing, but of course, being an FPGA, you can run at nice high clock rates. Um, because obviously when you're measuring that um, board rate time, you need to have enough resolution to get, get enough accuracy. So you, you need um, a fairly high clock to do that sampling because you need to get within a couple of percent uh, of the board rate so you need, need quite high timing resolution. So these are our two inputs, UR2 which is our RX data and UR clock which is our clock. We've got this state machine clocked on the UR clock. Now we've got two latches, we're latching the input data and then we're latching it a second time. Um, the reason for that is that if, you, if you've got an external asynchronous signal and you just latch it and start trying to use it you can get into an issues where if you happen to clock it just as it's changing the latch output can go unstable for a short period of time it's a phenomenon called metastability uh, and basically bad things can happen so we've basically double latched it so we've got a latched version and um, a secondary latched version um, so we can, got, we can sort of look for edges and differences when we get a start bit edge for example so the auto board Simple state machine. Here we're waiting for the start bit. You are busy. This is the flag to um, the the UART state machine to say that to tell it that the uh, auto board system is idle and waiting for for its calibration. So don't do anything. Um, resets the timer and looks for the edge. So if it's seeing a um, a falling edge. Then it goes to the next state, so that is the start of our um, timing period. During the time period, just increments the timer, and if it sees the end of the start bit, because the line goes high again, it goes to the next state, and it latches the value of the timer. So that's now our board period, you know, the length of that uh, initial eight zero pulse. And then it goes into this uh, a hold off state. So as long as data is coming in. Uh, we keep, we, we're using the same timer to do, to do our timeout because we, we've latched its value to get the board rate so we can actually recycle bits in that timer um, to now use that as a, um, uh, the timeout. So if the timeout times out then we go back to our wait, waiting state. So that's basically if it's roll, roll, rolling around to zero. Um, and if we, basically if we see any transition on the input then 
it resets it. So as long as we've got transitions on the input, it'll just keep reset resetting that timer. And when they stop, it'll then time out. Again, we're just setting a flag to tell the UART that we're in that, that mode and that's it. That's the auto board stuff. We've got a board, ge board rate generator, which is simply a, uh, a counter. It just counts down. If it's zero, then it reloads with the board rate. So it's just a simple variable period timer. And the actual UART, again, it's a simple state machine. It's got uh, four states waiting for the start bit. Um, this is actually a flag, basically when it's f received something it sets a flag and then whoever's receiving it has to acknowledge that just to uh, make sure that uh, you won't, yeah, every byte only gets recognised once. Um, so if we see the negative edge of our start bit and we're, we've done our auto board then it generates a half bit time to get us our halfway sample point initializes our receive register um, there's basically a one mark a bit as the data comes in the data sort of comes in from this end and this one moves down to the end and then when it hits the end that means we've got all, all our eight bits and the stop bit and then goes to the uh, the next day also resets the board clock is just the board rate clock rate it just make sure that's synchronized and this is just our initial bit to get us to the start through the start bit so it, you know, this this delay basically gets us to our, our sample point in the um, start bit. So the next bit time, if board clock that's saying you know when the board board rate generator has, has gone tick, get our data in. So we take our input data and then merge that with the rest of the receive register. If that marker bit has gone down to bit one, then that means we've got our full byte otherwise we just go back and wait for the next one and then when we've got the byte we check our stop yeah check that the stop bit's valid if it is then we just latch, latch the data signal that it's done and that's it so that that's basically our entire receive UART so it's sort of, yeah, very simple very straightforward but very flexible because it means you can you know all these timings can be very flexible um, this will auto board from about from about 500 k bits up to 4 megabits, but really the, the upper limit is basically how fast you clock this to be able to time that it that um, uh, time that a zero period accurately enough. And the lower end is just how many bits you've got in your timers. You know this could auto board from 4 megabits down to 400 board if you had a lot if you had big enough uh, values in the timer. But that would get a little bit ridiculous. And one other thing, the um, when what the board rate generator is doing is it's ignoring the bottom three bits of that timer because of course the eight zero represents eight bit times so our board rate timer is one eighth of that and of course the reason we chose eight zero is that uh, eight is a very nice easy number to divide by you don't really want to be dividing by seven in logic whereas yeah eight because we've got a free choice we divide by eight so we just ignore the bottom three bits and that's our um, bit time